Okay, let's try this. Uh, okay, guys, let me just see if I can share my screen. Get started here. Okay, beautiful. <clears throat> okay, so I want to start. Um, Part two, so anatomical terms. So uh, let's really get into the beginning of a and And please realize, I mentioned in the last video, so we're gonna be learning the foundation of everything and we're gonna start teaching uh, you or you'll teach me or we'll get started with learning a new language, right? So once again, this is the building blocks for everything. So, um, I know we're doing this online, it's gonna be a, a little different and um, a lot more um, <clears throat> undisciplined for you. So you have to start using some discipline. Uh, but the cool thing is like, you guys don't have to literally show up to campus uh, three times a week <coughs> or once a week for two and a half hours or whatever. So you can do this asynchronistically whenever you want. You've got mastering now, you should have some version of the textbook, you've got the PowerPoints for review only. Um, the other thing I want to let you know is you can try to memorize whatever you want. Um, and you should be memorizing some things, but you have to start thinking um, outside the box and start um, using application for all of this. All right. Um, this is a three credit course. All right. So uh, it's three credits, but in real life in real time it should be technically a six credit course you also have labs so labs should um coincider should be a supplement to this but literally i'm not kidding when i tell you guys need to be spending at least six hours a week minimum learning this and six hours isn't checking your phone every 10 minutes or whatever this has to be um direct studying and if you get tired studying um take a little break, jump on mastering, do some kind of flashcards or do something or watch a YouTube video or you know, go, go watch a, a, something on Netflix for 40 minutes or whatever and then come back to it. Um, if you're really, really tired, take a small nap, wake up, um, start studying, whatever you're, isn't coming to you, start writing it down so you can go over it and over and over it again, right? So it's gonna be a relatively difficult course all right, but it can be a lot of fun. Um, I, uh, truth be told, I only got a B plus in this course when I took it in the mid 80s, but uh, the deal is I didn't have PowerPoint, I didn't have lecture videos, I didn't have mastering, I literally had the textbook, and class consisted of um, the teacher talking and filling out a small outline, and then I would go home, and read the book over and over and over again, write things down and take notes. All right, so we're at a little bit of an advantage here, but let's get started. So in anatomical terms, all right, so uh, share standard anatomical position. All right, so you'll get a question on this on the exam, uh, I'm sure at some point. Um, your body's erect, which means standing up, feet slightly apart, so shoulders width apart, palms facing forward. Okay, the thumb is pointing away, that's lateral away from the body. Okay. Directional terms uh, describe one body structure in relation to the other. So you're gonna say, well, this was more lateral, this is more medial, this is more proximal, this is more caudal, this was more whatever, so in respect to something else. You always have to uh, have a relationship to another body structure. So it was lateral to the heart, it was medial to the lung. It was inferior to the trachea. I'm making these up as I go along. It doesn't really matter. They're always going to be in relation to something else. And I said last time I did the video, if we start speaking this language and practicing it, when you get into healthcare or you're in a healthcare setting, whether you're a patient or you're with somebody, if you start talking in this language, like I said, things will generally always change. Um, for the better or, um, you know, I'm not gonna say you don't get great care, but sometimes care is slightly more elevated just because they know that you um, 
are educated in, in some part of the healthcare field. Right, so direction is always based on standard anatomical position. So when you're when you're speaking medically, you're assuming that the patient is standing in front of you, facing you. Their palms are face forward. Their uh, feet are uh, shoulder lift width apart. All right, and then remember when you're looking at your patient, your right is their left. Okay, so you have to start. Um, that'll come with practice. All right. So right and left refer to the body being viewed, not right and left of the observer. All right, and here's some basic uh, clarifiers here. Superior or cranial, towards your cranium, your brain, towards the head end or upper part of the structure of the body. The head is superior to the abdomen. All right, so if you're, you know, this person, this is, they're um, looking at us. All right, apparently they have no eyes or nose or anything, but there's the abdomen. The head is superior to that. Inferior or caudal, so this is cranial. Caudal always means feet or, or inferior. Away from the head end or towards the lower part or structure of the body, so below. Okay. Anterior, right, the front is, um, in medical terms, is usually ventral, right? Um, posterior is always dorsal. So uh, towards the front of the body, so it would be uh, anterior ventral, the breastbone, or we're going to learn this as sternum, right? Is anterior to the spine, or it's actually superficial to the spine too, which means it's, it's, uh, yeah. So it's m more towards the surface than the spine from the anterior, all right? Posterior or dorsal towards the back. The heart is posterior to the breastbone, all right? And uh, true. Uh, story when I was taking my board exam, the uh, board examiner asked me to uh, point to the uh, it was like the eighth dorsal uh, spinous process, and I looked at them like, "What the hell are you talking about?" So we learned it in grad school as you know posterior or thoracic um, eight or whatever, but he was telling me dorsal, so. I was old school, but the terminology was the same, and I should have known that. So I literally had to look at him and go, I have no idea what you're asking me. And then he's like, the rat. I'm like, oh, okay. So um, when we learn these things, I may give you more than one term. One is, uh, could be more um, ancient, not ancient, but it could be an older term, but you don't know who you're gonna be dealing with or where they went to school. So if you are dealing with someone who went to school in let's say uh, India or China, or you know, it doesn't really matter. Costa Rica, Caribbean, doesn't matter. Their vernacular or their terminology might be slightly different and they're gonna have accents. Um, they're gonna to learn to pronounce things differently. So you have to be a little bit more um, fluid and fluent, right? All right, so medial always means midline, all right? So towards the midline of the body or of the inside. So medial, we we'll learn sagittal cuts and transverse and oblique, we'll learn all these things, all right? <clears throat> lateral is always away. So lateral, <clears throat> away from the midline, the body, of the uh, outer side of. So if you're describing something to someone, you could just say, well, you know, this uh, subcutaneous wound was, you know, to millimeters and diameters, lateral to whatever. And then you can say that, and the uh, person you're talking to on the phone or you're speaking to uh, when you're changing rounds or whatever, they're gonna know exactly what you're talking about. They're gonna have a very good idea of the general vicinity of whatever you're talking about. Intermediate is between a, a medial and lateral structure. So, you know, if I was talking about your, your lungs, they're kind of intermediate. They're not quite, because uh, there's two of the bilateral, so it's not completely meeting, it's not completely in the sagittal plane, but it's not completely lateral like the ribs. So <clears throat> a good example would be uh, intermediate would be the lungs or you know, let's say the, uh, the bladder. Um, it's still uh, relatively uh, medial, but it takes up a little bit bigger area. So you could say it's intermediate or um, the jejunum or uh, whatever is intermediate. It's not completely uh, median, it's not completely lateral. <clears throat> Some of these, you know, sometimes these terms are interchangeable and sometimes there's no exact term for whatever it is. 
so proximal is closer to the origin of the body part or the point of attachment of a limb to the body right so point of attachment like um, <clears throat> the acetabulum is proximal to the curl part of the foot or you know you could say the um, the acromion process is proximal to the thenar eminence over here on the thumb or whatever so when you start learning these terms and when you we start talking about muscles you know the origin always co goes towards the uh, uh nutrition or goes towards the origin and then you have to figure out well you know one part is always proximal and the other part is going to be always going to be distal right so distal is farther from the origin of the body part or the point of attachment of the limb or body trunk right so like the wrist is distal to the elbow or reconon process, right? So or the, uh, the, the, we could say the patellar is, is proc or distal to the head of the femur. Superficially, you're gonna learn uh, over and over again, when we talk about um, <clears throat> body parts or uh, even cellular structures. So superficial is always on the surface from the observer. So you're observing it. So superficial to you, if I said that your sternum is superficial to your heart, all right, if that patient is uh, in anatomical position and you're facing their anterior, all right. Now, if I'm uh, facing the patient from the posterior looking at them, all right, at that point, the heart is going to be superficial to sternum. From, from that perspective, you're looking at the posterior portion, uh, or you can say we're looking at the, the spinous process, and then you go in deeper to the, the pericardium or the heart, and then further from that away would be the sternum. From that perspective, um, the heart would be um, superior, or super, su I'm sorry, superficial to the sternum. From that viewpoint, if you turn the patient around, you face them from the anterior. Now, in anatomical position, is that's what you're looking at. And the sternum would be superficial to the heart or pericardium or lungs or whatever structure is going to be uh, deep or, um, yeah, deep. Um, away from the body surface or more internal. And there's a lot of things I'm mastering to practice this. They'll give you... Um, sagittal cuts or transitive cuts and they'll give you all these different things to just kind of fill in so um you guys are really fortunate you have mastering it's a super super uh cool tool to use um like i said i'm not going to assign the stuff in there but really it's extremely advantageous to do it so you know start reading your book and start playing with mastering if you're not a big a uh, person who wants to read, you can get the ebook and go through. And uh, if you miss something, it should redirect you to that portion of the book where that um, part was. You have to go searching for it. Back in the day, I had to go to the library and check out books. And if we didn't have something, you'd have to look through five different books in the index and figure it out. Um, you know, it was the late late 90s, early 2000s. So the internet was nowhere near what you guys have. We didn't have YouTube or any of that stuff. So you guys have a lot of really good resources, so I suggest you use them. So these two major divisions of the body, and we start talking about the appendicular skeleton or the axial skeleton, we'll break it down even more. But for right now, there's two major divisions of the body, axial or axis. So if you took uh, anatomy physiology is the X, Y, and Z axis. So axial <clears throat> would be your head, neck, and trunk. So right down the, the sagittal um, plane. Appendicular, or the appendixes, or ap appendicular would be your limbs and, and arms, legs. <clears throat> Regional terms designate specific areas uh, within the body division. So we're talking about thoracic, um, Cranial, we'll talk about different regional terms, all right? Um, and then when you get into gross anatomy, uh, if you go to grad school or whatever, you'll start doing regional, like you'll do regional sections of the body. All right, so here is a chart from your book, and these are really, really standard. Sometimes you'll get a variation in uh, curl, sural part of this. Um, 
Helix is a toe. You know, Digits, uh, Digits planar or planar is always um, the toe. Palmar Polynex is always the fingers. And so really, um, unfortunately, you really kind of have to know these portions. So if we were in, um, well, we are in real time. If we were here and it wasn't distance learning, we'd be in lab with all the models that we have here. And we would be learning these things. They're all numbered. Or I'd put uh, pieces of tape with numbers. And then I would say, you know, what is uh, number four would be here, you know, number six would be here. So you'd have to know uh, all these body parts. Like chromial is near the chromial process. Brachial always means arm. Anti-brachial where we draw blood would be in this area. So really, I mean, we, we could go through these uh, one at a time and bore you to death, but the teller uh, you know, is, is your kneecap with the teller. Pop video, um, usually that refers to the, the backside of the, the posterior surface of that joint. The pedal or pedal, from now on, always when you see pedal, I want you to think of foot. Um, and movement, sometimes it can mean that. And when we start going through here, start breaking down these words, because they're going to come from Greek or Latin or there's something. So please remember, these things were not named by taking um, Scrabble tiles and throwing them down and see how they line up. All right, so these are usually going to be named by um, what they look like, what they do. There's going to be some kind of describing factor for these terms. So when you see these in the book, or whatever, and there's a, it's a italics, there's astro or asterisk next to it, go to the bottom of the book and look and say, well, where did that orientation come from? Like in micro, we have staph aureus. All right, aureus means yellow. So when you grow that, the colony looks yellow. So that's how it got its name. So start thinking about, did these come from Latin, Greek, or whatever? And what did that mean? And then usually you're going to see part of that or chunks of or something similar to that is going to mean the same thing later on, later on, and later on. So let's start learning a new language. And we'll, we'll kind of start here with uh, alphabet. Sorry, don't like to <clears throat> the alphabet or words. Uh, and we'll start doing that. By the end of this course, we'll be able to talk in sentences, maybe. By the end of A and P2, we'll be able to, to start talking in paragraphs and making sense of a whole lot of this, hopefully. Here's the same type of thing, but from the posterior. All right, so you could say your shoulder blade. Uh, you would have said that before, but from this point on, we're going to call it the scapula. And there's your vertebra or vertebral column, um, sacrum or sacral, gluteal or gluteus maximus. So you kind of have to look at all of these terms. And I said there's popliteal is the backside of the patella. So it's the posterior part of that joint. Fibular is um, either uh, fibula is the bone, or uh, peroneal uh, is the name. This is the peroneal nerve runs down the lateral part of the um, leg. This is the thigh. This is the leg. All right. So start really quizzing yourself and mastering. They should have this um, with uh, labels, and it should be blank. So you maybe you want to make a, make a couple copies of that and start going with you, study these for a while, start writing them out, and then testing yourself. And if there's one you consistently miss, you want to flashcard that, make sure you know it over and over again. Because um, in real life or on a uh, midterm quiz or whatever, like in grad school, if there'd be one thing you just couldn't remember and you'd be like, oh my God, no, I just can't do it anymore. And then you would go to your lab practical or whatever, and you would actually pick that card, you'd pick they, you know, they randomly generate these, you get that question. You're like, really, of the 85,000 things I learned, you picked the one that I couldn't memorize. So just start remembering these, these certain uh, terms, what they mean. All right, so we'll get into some body planes. Um, so you're going to start doing body planes. You know, if you're doing imaging or whatever, you're going to want to do this. But I want you guys, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I kind of remember what it was like. Um, when I first took a &P and I was much younger, like 25 years ago or whatever. And I remember how daunting it was. But now, like, uh, as a healthcare person, you start thinking medically, you start thinking of 
you know, when I'm looking at a patient, I literally can slice the body in half and I can see the organs and I can kind of run that all through my head and it'll come in time. So we'll start learning about some of these body planes and sections. So surfaces along which body or surface structures can be cut for anatomical studies. So if I was doing a, a sagittal uh, cut, I'd be dividing the body in half, left and right from the anatomical position or right down the medial plane, right? I'm talking about a frontal or coronal uh, plane that usually a uh, frontal, front, back. So that could be, you know, you want to think of uh, anterior, posterior, whatever. Transverse is horizontal. So, you know, if we're going to think about these two, think about algebra. Like there was the X plane, the Y plane, and the Z plane came out this way. Right? So one was kind of transverse, one was sagittal, one was, was frontal. Right? So start thinking about the delineation of those things or, or um, in, in 3D. So thinking about that in, in different dimensions, right? So sections are cuts or sections made along a body plane named after the plane. So a sagittal cut results in a sagittal section. So literally if I had a bandsaw or whatever and I was cutting someone in half, I have a sagittal section. Or I could say, I need a left parasagittal section. So you take the, the, the person or whatever, you skew it to one side, and then you'd be, uh, sagittal would be here. If I wanted a left sagittal, I'd be cutting here. Like if I wanted to cut through the heart, I would do um, more of a left sagittal cut because it's, the heart is slightly left in the body. All right, so sagittal plane divides <clears throat> body vertically into right and left parts. This is a sagittal section if cut along this plane. And mid-sagittal or medium plane, cut was made perfectly on the midline. So that's a mid-sagittal telling you directly <clears throat> equal portions, 50-50. But parasagittal, or parasagittal, like I said, is going to be cut off center. Right? So you wouldn't, we couldn't just say I want a parasagittal plane. Well, that doesn't do me any good. You want it left or right parasagittal and how far over from the sagittal portion do you want? You know, do you want, you know, six centimeters parasagittal or whatever? You have to give me um, an orientation. So sagittal is your orientation. Then you have to give me a little bit more direction. In respect to that, I want to go over this certain amount. All right, so frontal divides the body vertically into anterior and posterior parts, front and back. Like I said before, frontal or coronal, we're gonna just lop you in half, right? So you'd have 50% anterior, 50% uh, posterior. Transverse uh, body divides horizontally 90 degrees to a vertical plane. So a strict transverse cut is completely level on the horizon, um, you know, with a protractor or whatever, it would be 90 degrees. <clears throat> oblique is can be anything other than 90 degrees. So I could have a 5% oblique, 10 up to 90, no, theoretically. That would be transverse. So anything between 0 and 89 degrees, well, 1, sorry, 1 and 89 degrees would be some kind of an oblique um, angle. <clears throat> there's a, there's kind of a picture if you want to, um, it's actually a really good orientation. So, you know, this would be median or mid-sagittal. So that's mid-sagittal is telling me it's exactly half and half. Frontal or coronal is you're literally like frontal, like your frontal lobe. You're literally cutting it um, from superior to inferior, inferior to superior, literally in half. And transverse is just cutting it completely at a 90 degree angle from here to here. Right. And this is what we'd use it for. So if you were doing a um, um, CT scan or an x-ray or an MRI, somebody had like lower back pain or whatever, you're going to do a, a mid-sagittal plane. So now I can see here is the middle of that um, nucleus propulsus of uh, um, the spinal um, discs, all right? But if, if this person had gone in for a CT scan or an MRI, they literally, they'll give you a, um, 
a scout view, an overall view, and then they literally take that and they take that um, satchel plane and they just keep slicing it. And they'll tell you, like, this is sliced from uh, left to right or right to left. So as they're slicing these planes, you can actually go in and they'll divide that mid sagittal section and into like 50 different slices. You can, you can scan in your mind from left to right what exactly what's going on in that bone or osseous tissue or what's going on in that disc. And here is a uh, frontal plane. So this should theoretically divide the body from uh, anterior to posterior. And if you if look, there's the, the lung tissue, there's the heart, right? Um, here's the um, head of the humerus, right, of the arm or whatever. I'm pretty sure this is not, better not be a human. It doesn't look quite right. So I want to say that looks more like, a, uh, could be a human, but I don't think so. All right. Um, and there is a um, transverse plane, all right? And looking at the, the size of that uh, vertebral body and that spinous process. And then I'm looking here, this is the liver, all right? There's the spleen. So I know I'm kind of up in here in the thoracic cavity. And I can tell by the, the, um, the spinous process, the orientation of that, that that's a thoracic but I can also tell by the organ systems in there exactly, not exactly, but I can tell you the region within an inch or so of where they slice that. Right. <clears throat> so once again, here's the, here we go. So with uh, MRI or whatever, we can go in and we can slice all that. Okay. So body cavities and membranes. So please realize all of your body cavities are separated by membranes. Right? And we want to kind of separate that. Now sometimes fluid and things can, can move through these membranes through osmosis or diffusion or whatever. But we do want some kind of a containment to separate these regions. Um, you know, and we want these membranes to have a serous um, fluid around them so there's no friction. But, you know, think about it, too. If we ever had an infection or a wound or whatever, we wouldn't want that infectious agent or whatever to be able to flow all over. So we want to contain it in certain um, portions, and especially like the thoracic cavity. We want to keep that membrane or that cavity. We want a certain uh, atmospheric pressure for that so the respiratory process runs completely um, well. All right, so body contains inner, uh, internal cavities that are close to the environment. Cavities provide different degrees of protection to organs within them. All right, so we want different protection um, <clears throat> between the heart and lungs. So that's, you know, you kind of have your ribs there. You kind of have some kind of a bony structure um, so that you wouldn't, um, if you could blow to the chest or whatever, you wouldn't be deflating your lung or tearing your lung or you wouldn't be going to cardiac shock if you were to, to shock the heart and stop that internal rhythm. All right, so the two sets of cavities. So dorsal body cavity and ventral. Now remember back, dorsal was always that posterior and ventral is always that anterior. So we're going to um, separate the body into those two cavities. All right. <clears throat> so the dorsal body cavity, so I want to start thinking posterior. <clears throat> All right. Um, and generally I want to start thinking of that is your brain, right, the cranium there, and the spinal. So the, the cranial cavity encases the brain and that osseous structure, all right? And the uh, vertebral cavity uh, encases the spinal cord. Right. So, you know, please realize your spinal cord is going up through these, um, all these vertebral bodies and that bony structure. Excuse me. So the bones can rotate for motion, but we also want to remember that that, um, Spinal cord contains all of your nerve roots, your afferent and efferent um, impulses from your brain, your processing centers, and taking all those, those reflexes, that um, environmental information sends it up to your brain, your brain processes, hopefully the correct response instantaneously and sends it back down efferently so you have a reaction or the proper reaction to it. We want to make sure that we um, 
control that, um, let's call it a circuit board or whatever. We want to control that process center. We don't want it to be damaged. Right? So there's different cavities. Right? So there's your cranial cavity. There's your uh, vertebral cavity. And remember, vertebral runs all the way from cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. You see kind of a shadow there, possibly. All right, there's your pleural cavity. So whenever you see pleural membrane, pleural cavity, all right, pleural could mean more than one if you're thinking mathematically, but pleural here always is that thoracic uh, cavity, lungs, think of respiration, you know, whatever's going on in that cavity, they're going to refer to it over and over again as pleural something or pleurisy, uh, you know, inflammation of um, the some part of the respiratory tract. Pericardial, so cardio always usually means heart. Peri, from now on, is going to mean around circumference, all right? Your thoracic cavity, these are your thoracic vertebrae, there's a thoracic cavity separated by the diaphragm, very key structure. All right, so we're going to separate your thoracic cavity um, from the abdominal cavity, and then there's the pelvic cavity, which is going to um, house your bladder and some of the reproductive organs. So there's a chart here, just kind of um, start looking that over, kind of memorizing, but go through your book or go through mastering and just kind of start analyzing what organs are in there. And I specifically remember on <clears throat> my AMP one exam, my first exam, they literally gave me like this, well, it was back then it was ditto sheets or whatever. They gave me a sheet and with a uh, body and then we literally had to, our instructor made us draw all, you know, draw what organs were in certain areas. And I remember being upset because I got something mixed up. I don't know if I had like, from all I know back, I could have the liver and the, where the lung was. I don't know what I did, but I just remember going, I thought I knew this and I, I clearly didn't. All right, so the ventral, remember ventral is going to be anterior as opposed to dorsal or posterior. House the internal organ, collectively called viscera. All right, so your internal organs are your viscera or if someone's inviscerated back in the savage days, they would take your internal guts out. I think that was... Uh, <clears throat> Of the actor right now. All right, so viscera, or if you have a visceral response to something, so you see something uh, horrific or something that really upsets you, and you can feel your internal organs, like your digestive tract, just twinging. You had a visceral response. That was your viscera. Your internal organs were having an issue with that. You responded. Your um, sympathetic nervous system automatically responded. You had no control over that. So there's two subdivisions which are separated by the diaphragm. This is a very, very key portion there. So start thinking about this. You're, you're swallowing water, you're inhaling air, you're swallowing food. It's going through your esophagus, all right, <clears throat> down through into your intestines, all right. But literally the esophagus has to pierce through your diaphragm. It has to go through your diaphragm. So if you've ever talked to someone or heard about a, hiatal hernia or somebody had um, ferrous esophagus or, you know, what they said, I have indigestion. Well, usually that's the esophagus gets hung up on that opening from the, the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is a very, very important structure separating that thoracic cavity um, from your abdominal pelvic cavity. So remember the abdominal region, your abdomen, your abs is gonna be more superior then your pelvic floor, your pelvic cavity. But if we are separated in two, we're gonna have thoracic and then abdominal pelvic cavity. So your thoracic cavity, remember your thoracic is up here. Two pleural cavities, right and left, right? You have two lungs, right? Or correct, I'm sorry, using the word correct. If I say right, meaning that you were correct, you don't wanna confuse that with left and right. So. Usually, um, if we're communicating with each other and someone says, you know, we're talking about anatomical structures and someone says, well, it's on the left, right? I believe like, it's on the left, correct? So you want to make sure that you start separating 
um, when you're uh, confirming something with another healthcare professional, you don't really want to use the word right. You want to start using the word correct or confirmation. All right, so just start thinking about that for a second. So two pleural cavities, each cavity surrounds one lung. Right? And we'll talk uh, later when we get into the specifics. Your left lung has two lobes, your right lung has three lobes. And the reason for that is, I said, mentioned earlier, your heart is slightly left. So it's gonna take up some of that space. So there's a little less room in the left. So the bronchi are angled a little bit differently in the left as opposed to the right, but we'll get into all that. So your media stinum, all right, media stinum. So start thinking medial sternum, all right, media stinum, medial sternum. Contains the uh, pericardial cavity, surrounds other thoracic organs such as the esophagus, trachea. So it's all midline, your esophagus, <clears throat> your trachea, there's your sternum, is your, you probably learned there's your breastbone, um, formerly, as of today, it's now your sternum. Can't go back. All right, and then there's a peri, I said peri is around, cardio cavity, it closes the heart. So there's gonna be a, a fluid bag surrounding your heart, it's gonna be filled with fluid because your heart's constantly moving, producing, it's a muscle, it's producing heat, you wanna be able to cool that off, you want to get rid of any friction. And then another key thing is your heart, the apex of your heart is literally attached to your diaphragm because that thing's beating all the time. If it wasn't tethered down, it'd be bouncing all over your thoracic cavity. So we're gonna tether that right to the diaphragm. All right. The abdominal pelvic cavity, abdominal cavity contains your stomach, intestines, spleen, and liver. All right. You know, you're gonna start, you know, after you get um, more profuse with this, someone's gonna say, oh, my tummy hurts or my stomach hurts. And literally it's their intestines. You're like, no, that's not your stomach. But to them, that whole thing is their stomach. So they don't know any better, but um, you're gonna start going, uh, no, that's your intestines in your head. You can't really say it to them, right? And there's your pelvic cavity, it contains the urinary bladder, reproductive organs, and the rectum. So just think of that lower uh, cavity around your, your, your base chakra, that area down in there. Right? <clears throat> so problems occur when structures are strained or neighboring uh, cavities. So homeostatic balance. So if, you know, if your brain and everything uses that negative feedback loop we have, so if we're uh, short on something or we're missing something, if we uh, do some changes to rectify the situation, then it'll shut off and everything's at equilibrium. But sometimes the mechanisms don't shut off and they never get turned on, or sometimes uh, organs from one cavity can start impeach and, uh, impeach and pairing on other organs, right? So we'll, we'll talk later about fistulas and how that digestive tract can start rubbing and then uh, we have fistula is going on and that can really alter the entire flow of the gastrointestinal tract. Right. Oh, here's the example. So hyaluronic hernia part of the stomach protrudes the diaphragm and the thoracic cavity. It can push stomach acid into the esophagus causing irritation, referred to as heartburn or Barrett's esophagus. Um, so the stomach acid, uh, the, the um, Sphincter doesn't close all the way. So when you have all that indigestion, you're burping that hydrochloric acid in your stomach up into your esophagus and that constant irritation starts causing that tissue to go into metaphysics, starts changing tissue type uh, as a supportive or reconstructive protective barrier and that can start leading to some imbalances. All right, membranes in the uh, ventral body cavity, we have serosa called the serous membrane. So when you start thinking about these, remember, or start thinking about these organs are, are wrapped in a, um, you could say like a Ziploc bag with a little bit of water or fluid in there, because these, these organs are constantly moving. We need some kind of lubrication, just like the pistons in your engine. We, if they're rubbing constantly, it's gonna produce heat, there's gonna be all kinds of friction, it's gonna start eroding the surface area. So we want some kind of a serous membrane. Thin double layered membrane that covers surfaces in the ventral cavity. <clears throat> Parietal serosa line the internal uh, body cavity walls and visceral serosa covers the internal organs. Remember that? Viscera 
So you want that because your digestive tract is constantly moving. We want it to um, be able to move. It's constantly going through peristalsis, moving that uh, food in a one-way direction. If, um, peristalsis moving it towards the rectum. If we have retro uh, peristalsis, that means the digestive system is going backwards, and that's when you start vomiting out bile and all kinds of crazy stuff if you have an obstruction. Right. So double layers are <coughs> separated by a slit-like a cavity called the serous fluid. We want to be able to produce that fluid when we need it. We don't want too much, but we don't want too little. We want just enough um, so that it, it keeps it lubricated and keeps the friction down and the heat down. Okay. So um, name for specific cavities and organs that are associated with like pericardium, cardio, um, cardiac arrest, or um, Myocardium, uh, myo means muscle. Cardium is the specific term for heart muscle with the intercalated discs and things. But peri means around. So we, I said before, we want that uh, membrane around the heart. So the heart's constantly beating. It doesn't get a vacation or even a one second break. It constantly has its own intrinsic beat. Doesn't even need to be told. It's all self-regulating. Um, good pacemaker. Um, but we, we want that <clears throat> um, serous membrane because we have the lungs around it and your lungs are constantly moving, your heart's constantly moving, and without it, they'd be rubbing against each other and be very, very, very tight. The uh, pleura, um, the lungs, once again, they have their own lining. And pleurisy, I mentioned that before, is when you have an irritation to that. And can you imagine what it's like every time you breathe to have that friction rub um, when you're long onto your um, serous membrane, around your ribcage, it's extremely painful. All right. Peritoneum uh, is that uh, cavity around your abdominal, uh, in your abdominal pelvic uh, cavity. And that, like if you had, um, <coughs> excuse me, if you had um, uh, a, rupture, a rupture of the appendix, it can uh, rupture all that bacteria from your um, GI tract and your um, appendix ruptures and goes into the peritoneum, all right? And it's floating around in there. And then you have the entire area that was theoretically sterile, full of bacteria, and the bacteria has no competition. It's like, oh, cool, because they've got all these nutrients and fluid, they can just start multiplying like crazy. Not a good situation. All right, so here, you know, this is pretty much in every uh, textbook I've ever read or every diagram. So I want you to think of that. If that's your heart, that's your heart, like the fist, it's going into that double membrane. But please remember, I'm going to trace this for you guys. So if this was a balloon or the, the uh, serous membrane, think of this. All right, this and this are all exactly the same membrane. Continuous, it's contiguous, is the correct term. So there's no separation, there's no seams, it's all one continuous um, <clears throat> membrane. So serous membranes can become uh, inflamed as a result of infection or other causes. Normally, smooth layers can become rough and even and stick together, resulting in excruciating pain. I just mentioned that friction rub. <clears throat> or if somebody fractures, there's a hairline fracture in the lung, or they have an inflammation or an infection in part of that lining, every time they breathe, it's rubbing. All right? So if you guys have ever had like a, a hangnail or a paper cutter, imagine, remember when you just touch that, how excruciating it is? Imagine every time you breathe, something's rubbing constantly. All right? So you're going to be very, very, uh, use a lot of trepidation. You're going to breathe very, very shallow because if you take a deep breath, it hurts even more. The examples are pleurisy and peritonitis, two of which I just gave you guys. So the abdominal, pelvic quadrants and regions, now we can break them down even more. So this is just right, left, um, upper and lower. We can break them down even to more like hypo, um, cardiac, and there's, there's, you can break it down into even nine regions. So there's right upper, left upper, right lower, left lower. That's pretty simple, all right? But then we can break it down into um, 
you know, like hyper, yeah, hyper and, and hypo and so that's pretty basic. You know, if I said, you know, where's your gallbladder located? You go, oh, my gallbladder. Well, it's by my liver that's right upper, yeah, right upper quadrant, right? But now we can break it down into nine other regions. All right, so we have right hypochondriac. Right, you've heard of a hypochondriac. So hypo generally means lower or less, all right? You guys you kind of know where the lumbar region is, or so we kind of mentioned that, the lumbar spine. Umbilical always is relating to your belly button. It's umbilical cord, umbilical region. Uh, right iliac or inguinal. <clears throat> so uh, we'll learn with iliac nerve or um, iliacus or inguinal. So that would usually, it's like uh, inferior to the umbilical. Hypogastric. Hypo means lower gastric. You know, you can think, well, what does that mean? Could be stomach, we don't know. What does it mean? Uh, um, left the only after inguinal. Right. So here you can you can look into this. <clears throat> Here's left hypochondriac, right? Chondrium, right? Right. Epi means on. So there's epigastric, right? Umbilical, right lateral left lateral lumbar, that's your lumbar spine. Inguinal is always gonna be lower, and hypogastric is gonna be hypo means below. In addition to the two body cavities, the body has several smaller cavities that are exposed to the environment. All right, so whenever I teach uh, microbiology or a &P or whatever, I want you to start thinking anything that has a mucous membrane. Right, mucus that slimy area is exposed to the external environment. So literally, um, let me tell you guys your digestive tract, your respiratory tract, your reproductive tract, they're literally outside your body. Right, so I want you to think of those hollow tubes that are literally exposed to the outside of your body. Okay. Right, if you don't believe me, you could literally take all of those areas I talked about, you could fill them with water and then pour it back out. So it's literally outside of your body. And then areas that are not exposed to the are synovial cavities like joints. So they're inside your body. There's no way for the outside environment to get into those areas. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up here. So that should be chapter two. Um, I think I think it was this class, or maybe it's the other one. I was thinking about ooh, I think it was Wednesday nights for this. If that works for everyone, uh, we can we can figure that out. But um, shoot me some email uh, or whatever. Um, message me so that I know. I'm really thinking like Wednesday, maybe seven. If that works, I usually have patients usually till six and then I need like a half an hour to get home and uh, set up everything. So Wednesday at seven, if that doesn't work for anyone, if there's a better night, uh, we can work it out. I completely am fluid as far as this. I'm here to help you guys learn. Um, hopefully there's a little humor, there's a little um, levity in the course. And like I said, I'm going to go over things over and over and over and over again and try to relate everything to everything. So at some point in time, things will really click for you guys. All right. Um, have a good weekend, but like I said, start starting. All right. So stop. Stop share.